on my knees. On my knees. I just got to make the journey somehow. Yeah. Oh. Somehow, Lord. Somehow, Lord. Somehow, Lord. Somehow, Lord. I have got to make the journey somehow. Oh. Somehow, Lord. Somehow, Lord. Somehow, Lord. Somehow, Lord. There are two things that have always been constants in the Tucker family, music and ministry. Whether we're celebrating the happy times or dealing with the adversities of life, these two things have been ever-present reminders of the ties that bind us together. At the heart of this has always been Grandma. She encouraged all 16 of her children to sing, play the piano, and preach at an early age. Many of them would follow in her footsteps and become ministers themselves. I went to Raymond Bible Training Center. It was really one of the most, one of the most, I mean, it was a great experience in my life to learn things and uh, to see a lot in scripture I had heard and, and just to learn how to look words up and know what the Greek words when the original words and come you know I just had a ball you know I'm gonna share with mom I'm like so how's your walk with the Lord <laughs> you didn't get no points with well, Lord get rid of the Greek in the <laughs> I mean, you know, one time when I was in the Navy I called home and I said Mama you know, I, I believe the Lord led me to call you. She said, that's a shame. <laughs> the Lord ought not have to lead you to call your mom. <laughs> because every time I was with mom, when we went from round and round, church to church, you going to sing? I'd be like, no, mom, I'm tired of singing. I'm, she said, you know, they usually pay you when you sing. I said, I'm okay, mama. I'm okay with that. She said, well, how much money you got in your pocket? I said, 35 cents. I was like, seven. <laughs> seven, eight years old. I was preaching in uh, Germany, 1990, preaching in Germany. And this gentleman, after I get to preaching, he comes up and hands me an envelope and he says, give this to your mother and tell her I appreciate her ministry. I'm preaching in South America, in Suriname, preaching in an auditorium of a, few thousand, a couple of thousand people. And, and somebody said to me, did you see this man just looking at you during the service? I said, yes, I saw him. He said, he knows your mother. <laughs> so I'm in Aruba, ministering in Aruba, and somebody says, uh, Brother Noah, let's, uh, nobody won't, uh, it won't hurt nothing if we go into this casino for a few minutes. I said, nope, might be somebody that know my mother. It would be hard to overstate the importance of music or ministry in our lives. I guess they're the closest things we would have to a family trade. Of the 11 of Grandma's living children, five are pianists, six are ordained ministers, and most of them sing. Family gatherings have always been filled with music, and the trade has continued down through the generations. My grandmother started pastoring when my father and his siblings were just children. She needed musicians, so they really had no choice but to pick up an instrument. I walked in church one night, and Mama just said, there's my son, he plays the organ. He uh, came home the first night she brought him to church, and she introduced him as her son who could play the organ. Well. We found out later that he, that was the first time he'd ever been on an actual organ. <laughs> he played keyboard, of course, but uh, not the organ. So that's wow. when I, first time I ever played a B3 in a church oh was <laughs> that night. Wow. <laughs> George was 11, I was nine, uh, 10, and Jean was 12. We, 
We would go run revivals as children because um, she allowed us to do so. And uh, George would preach, you know, and Jean would play. I would sing. When I was, yeah, I don't know, maybe about seven, eight years old, or maybe nine, I don't know. But um, anyway, the church was full. And it was in Old Muggy. And my mother wanted me to play the piano for the church. Because I would get on the piano after church or by myself, I wouldn't even talk or anything. I wouldn't sing or anything like that. But anyway, she wanted me to play the piano. And uh, she said, I'll give you a dollar. I'll give you a dollar if you play. I wanted that dollar so bad, but I was just too bashful. They, they worked with me, they got me actually up there on the bench. I still wouldn't play. If you have anything you want my hands to do. Music played a big part in the outreach ministry of Grandma's mission. My father relayed a story to me that I had no memory of, but honestly, it didn't surprise me that much. He and his brother David were their mother's right-hand men during those mission days, and they got their entire families involved in the effort to evangelize and rehabilitate the men and women of Tulsa's most notorious red light district. This is way back, it, it changed so much, but it was bars just, and, and like I said, it was every corner, prostitutes in every corner, it was just, and so I would go down there and witness all the time, and so I, and so this one night, I just said, Lord, I'm going to take, I really felt God yeah, yeah. was moving on my heart to just let the children, let all the children oh, wow. walk through the neighborhood and sing. Uh -huh. Oh, man. So you don't remember, but all y'all were so small, and so they... I walked y'all through. It was these bars and prostitutes <laughs> and every, everything, and y'all walked in the neighborhood singing. Yeah. For God so loved the world, <laughs> He gave His only Son. Wow. You were, so you were probably four or five, wow. and Darlin' was like three. Mm. <laughs> wow. That's so yeah, wow. but y'all walked through, and y'all sang it, because y'all didn't mind singing, y'all wow. always sang. <laughs> Even when I went to the rescue home, it was just, now that was a whole different environment for me. It was just different. Mm. I would just say, these are not normal people. But they really were normal people. I was just in a different lane. That was like a bullet I just had to bite because he was my husband. Mm -hmm. And I knew he wasn't going to allow anything to happen to the children or me. And so I trusted that. Being in an environment like that was a huge test of a person's willingness to love the seemingly unlovable, but Grandma seemed to have a knack for it. She was never too put off by the seedy activity on Main Street, and even as children, we all took our cues from her and just learned to adapt to the environment. It was always amazing to me how, how she would handle the people, you know, the different types of people that she had to deal with. Well, of course, me as a child, it was frightening me. I mean, they would come in there and they would just, wow. I mean, they would, they come in there drunk and they come in there high. And Grandma would just be like, boy, sit down somewhere, you know? <laughs> she would say, it's her son, her children, you know? And it was just, and after seeing her doing that so much, you know, it, it I caught on to it that they are people. You kind of just learn, yeah, to be comfortable with anybody right yes. which it, not it be uncomfortable mm -hmm. around yeah just around those that you know whatever was different than what you were accustomed to her establishment was the only place in Tulsa really that you could come to her in any condition uh, different rescue homes or different uh, mission works in the city they wouldn't allow you to come in if you were drunk or high or, or, or whatever and Grandma would take him in any condition. 
In fact, she had become quite adept at dealing with the condition of alcoholism. If I had my way, if I had my way, if I As the children of an alcoholic father, she and her brothers and sisters had learned a great deal about the pervasive nature of that disease. Hers would be a childhood marked by poverty, hunger, and constant upheaval. My father was named Toby Anderson. He had been married before. When I knew him as my father, he was pretty well middle-aged like, you know. And he was a very wise person. Um, he had been converted to Jesus and he was doing very well. He was boss, he was in charge of of farms and things, and, and he was over sharecroppers and things. He was, you know, active in business, able to take care of his family, but he had a, a former experience in his first marriage that um, really set him back. He owned some land, you know, he was a creek freedman. When they brought Oklahoma in as a state, in the Union, then the Indians allotted so much uh, land. But at that time, they was enrolled as what they call Creek Freedmans, and he had a lot of them, 40 acres as a homestead, and then 100, I think it was 120 acres that he could sell or anything. So someone up, uh, opposed himself to be him and his wife and sold his land. And he began to try to pursue it, to get it back. And, and he fought it and fought it until he just went broke. But in the midst of that, he evidently was a social drinker. Like he increased his drinking to kind of get away from his problem. And he turned out to be an alcoholic. And he got worse and worse. For well, quite a few years, he's able to do business and take care of the family. And he just decreased and decreased until he was just like a different man. That experience seemed like just really troubled his mind and he just increased in his drinking. He never did really uh, rededicate himself to the Lord. So he just got dependent on uh, alcohol. And he just couldn't even rent any land. He couldn't. We wind up living in a um, on a campground in some Indian camp houses. Then from there, we went upside a mountain somewhere in a tent and a cellar. The tent was our place where we cooked and. And then the cellar was where we slept in. It, it, it was really sad. To be an African-American child growing up in the South in the 20s and 30s couldn't have been a glamorous thing to begin with, but to hear how that hardship was compounded by alcoholism was heartbreaking. In 2008, during my first filming trip to Tulsa, I asked Grandma what first led her to open a mission for the homeless, and that's the first time I heard her talk about the encounters she had with the street people at her resale shop on Archer. I had a, a crystal down on um, Archer and um, Boulder, and so many of the people that was homeless, they would come in there and sometimes they would try to sell me food, what they had gotten somewhere like canned goods. I came back to talk to Grandma again in 2009, and this time we discussed her childhood in some detail. She ended up talking quite a bit about Grandpa Toby. When she described her dad's decline into the throes of alcoholism, something she said jumped out at me. 
he got so he just have to go out and uh, pick vegetables wherever he can, uh, fruit, uh, go in the woods and get other uh, grapes and plums, wild stuff, and then he take and sell it. I didn't want to read too much into that. It was just a small thing, but maybe not. It almost felt like that rosebud moment from Citizen Kane, that elusive why that might explain a lifetime of drive and determination to relieve the suffering of the poor. Maybe this was her way of somehow righting the wrongs enacted on her dad by those shady land deals. Praise God, praise God. We're so happy to present you this recording from the Revival Center House of Prayer. We trust that it will be a blessing in your home or wherever you may listen to this recording. God is using music as never before. Amen. Gospel singing is one of the greatest things that I believe we're fortunate to enjoy except through prayer. We get so much from God through singing. We want you to relax and just enjoy the music and singing under the anointing of the Holy Ghost from this choir. God bless you. you know, she would open up her radio program with praise God, praise God. What a wonderful privilege it is to come your way Amen. and give you the good news that Jesus loves you. When I was 14 years old, um, she had uh, a radio broadcast that played on uh, the uh, AM station here. Um, she was just in the lineup of uh, Saturday preachers. Uh, and we, we would, my grandmother who raised me would listen to the lineup all day Saturday. So we'd hear her every Saturday. Seemed like to me I was wanting something that I didn't have. And that was the Holy Ghost. Now, I went to church, the Baptist church, Methodist church, but it wasn't nothing like being filled with the Holy Ghost. People, uh, Holy Ghost filled people. I mean, you know, you can just feel it. Your spirit bear witness to that spirit. So this is where, where uh, I gained strength to receive the Holy Ghost was through that radio broadcast. In the early days of Grandma's ministry, her radio broadcast played a pivotal role in helping her to get the message of the gospel out to the folks who were hungry for old-fashioned Bible preaching, served with a heavy dose of Pentecostal holiness. The folks who tuned in would get a taste of what her Sunday services were like, and many came from neighboring counties to see this fiery woman preacher who didn't mince words when she preached about a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Amen. So we thank God that we are here in this hour where we can stand up and, and, and be counted for Jesus because this is a dark day and, and you know, so much sin going on. As yes, we say, this little light of mine will let it shine. Don't you know if you turn all these lights out of this building and this scratch a match, it will get your attention. Amen. And now there's so much wickedness, Lord. There's so much wickedness going on. If you just purpose in your heart, I'm going to just let the best I know how. I may not know how. Honey, you'll be a light in this in this world. I turned my radio on, and they were shouting and speaking in tongues. And God blessed me to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Mother has been a role model for me for about 45 years. Grandma's radio broadcast was called Back to God. We took a trip back to her first church in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, the city where that broadcast began, 
and she agreed to sing a little of the theme song for us. Yeah. You want the history of that song? Yes. I wanted the theme song for my broadcast, and I, and I asked God, I said, I want a theme song. What song should I put on? And he said, well, he didn't tell me. I just went to sleep. And when I went to sleep that night, he let two ladies start a song. One lady started a song that I already knew. And this other lady started the song by Back to God. And she started out, she sung it. She has the music and the words, because we've been putting other words in it, you know, like, I'm glad I'm going back and all that. But God said, use that song. He said, use that song. So we used it for years. We used it on a television program. We use it. We use it now. It was through that radio program that her ministry really began to expand. The signal went out to several neighboring counties, and word started getting around that there was something special happening in Okmulgee. That was my church service. You know, a lot of times you've got a bunch of little children that you can't go to church, you know, all the time. And that was where I got my strength, is listening to that radio. I mean, it gives you strength to do your housework, to do your cooking, to tend to your children. I mean, that was something everybody needs in their home, is, the, is, the, is church service. When you can hear some praise and prayers and, and songs going up, praise God, it gives you life. That broadcast would eventually be the launching point for her establishing her own independent church. It would be the first of its kind pastored by a black woman in the state of Oklahoma. When we were growing up in Oklahoma, and mom uh, taught us some songs. We were the Tucker Trio. Did y'all know that? We were the Tucker Trio, and she would dress us alike, you know, in our little dresses. We get up a big old number one. That's a huge church, you know. And we would sing our little song. We had our little theme song. Here we are. Three gospel singers <laughs> traveling, traveling through nowhere. This. <laughs> Georgia would go, this bar would lay, because I sang lead, and Georgia sang tenor, and Minnie sang bass. And then we said, we traveled through, we ain't been nowhere. <laughs> Grandma's oldest three daughters, Jean, Georgia, and Minnie, were a pivotal support system for their mother in those early days. Oh, we've been married. Oh, we had that baby. She was part of the Church of God in Christ denomination at that time, which she would later split from. She traveled quite a bit doing youth meetings and revivals, and she enlisted her daughters as her backup choir and sometimes even as fill-in preachers. Summer we went to the Big Taft, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and ran a, was it a week? A, a week's week. revival. And Georgia I preached. Said. Georgia preached. Yeah! Georgia preached, ministering, and I played. This was like in the 50s. Yeah. When she'd be sick, because Mama used to be oh, sick a lot. She had a broadcast in her muggy, back to God, and um, she trusted George and I to go do that broadcast. And it was like, uh, we were teenagers, but we would go and do that broadcast for us. She knew we could do it, and she gave us positive feedback. Of my grandparents' oldest five girls, Aunt Jean, Aunt Georgia, Aunt Minnie, Aunt Barbara, and Aunt Viv, Aunt Jean, who was the oldest, was the only one who really kept up the practice of attending church when she left home. I asked Aunt Minnie why this was. Well, 
I, you know, me speaking personally, <laughs> like, okay, when, when I was younger, being made to go to church, <laughs> and that's where we spend our lives, I used to say, okay, when I get grown, I'm going to go to church when I want to. Nobody's going to ever make me go to church again. You know, it was like, okay, because uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it was a, a form of rebellion. Or, and I said, I would never make my, make my children go to church, you know. I'm, I'm glad you did. And uh, I don't know if it's right or wrong, you know. But I feel like you teach them. You teach your child in in the right, wrong, uh, morality, values, whatever, and let them make the decisions, you know. Hearing all those stories about how the older girls basically became traveling evangelists before they were even out of puberty actually shed a little light on this question for me. They were all out there on the front lines before they really had the chance to get things figured out. They also witnessed their mom suffer a lot of hurt at the hands of church people. I wanted to understand how that affected their view of church down the road, but of those oldest five girls, Aunt Minnie and Aunt Jean were the only ones still living. We lost Aunt Barbara in 1988, Aunt Georgia in 98, and Aunt Viv in 2010, just a year after this interview with Aunt Minnie was filmed. We would have uh I would say church in in our homes, in our own way, during all those years. So if some people might, might not recognize that as per se church because we weren't assembled in the building that was specified for church, but yet we were assembled in our homes. So I, I still Reverend Baptist Church. the dear child, and she preached a sermon that she called the dear child, and she would use Jean as an example. And one night we told, we, we, me and Dora were sitting together, and we said, Mama was preaching on that sermon and using Jean as an example, and we said we was going to get a ditch, get a ditch for her and put her in. <laughs> in danger, and I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, because Mama would say, you know, I mean, she was the one that she didn't have to, you know, she didn't have to prod and, you know, and and make, and, and Jean had it for some philosophy, you know, that, you know, she had shared with us. She just felt like she's going to be obedient until she got grown, and then she was going to do whatever she wanted to do. We understand that. None of us, <laughs> none of us got sense. that, that I know of. Most of my aunts and uncles have these stories of engaging in what my grandmother liked to call rebellion. Now, if you know anything about the Holiness Church, you know what all that involves. Beyond the obvious infractions of lying, stealing, and cheating, they were held to a pretty strict standard of conduct at home. For reasons I'll allow her to explain later on, my grandmother forbade her daughters to wear pants, shorts, makeup, tight clothing, and the boys couldn't wear shorts, and none of them were allowed to play sports or games of any kind. It could be a pretty stifling existence, and most of them found ways to exert their will in one way or another. Being under your dad, door was not a good place to be. <laughs> you know? Oh, he was, yeah, he was the devil incarnate. But <laughs> he, I, I think I, when I look at him, though, I know it's a God because, you know, He's not the same. He's, 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 he's definitely different. And, you know, I mean, I, I remember saying in my mind about where I wanted to go out and get me a testimony. Mm. I mean, I remember saying that, you know, it's like, I want people to see that there's a difference. Because I felt so hypocritical when I was in church in the choir and I was doing my dirt and stuff and nobody knew what I was doing. And, and I just felt so hypocritical, you know, and I thought to myself, 
And I thought this was me thinking to myself, really, it was the spirit that it came to me. But I thought, you know, I thought, I'm going to go out and I'm going to give me a testimony. And then when I come back, people are going to really know that I'm saved. You know, and boy, that was just about the craziest thing. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work very well. I mean, you know, I mean, as far as for the difference and stuff, I mean, I mean, not there's distinction for sure. Well, that's but it why wasn't you, bright. You were doing all kinds. Of I was buck wild, yeah. You know, because I mean, it was, it was like, when you thank go you. In that's church, what people I was. glorified. The message, if that's what it is, I'm gonna go give me a message, or right, I'm gonna know, go give me, and I even felt that I'm gonna go out and I get something so I can have something to talk about, right. you know. And you want to get something right. so you can connect, exactly. And uh, so you sitting in church, even though it's the right place to be, but you hearing stuff, people talk about these crazy things and crazy lives they live, but God, yeah. And it was like, wow, I need to know God yeah. like that. Yeah. That's the way we were bought up so we knew nothing other than church we were like uh that was our entertainment that was our spiritual growth that was our boys entertainment you know on saturday nights we would have like um that was entertainment night where we you know they sell hot dogs and ice cream and stuff and of course me and kids we play we never was uh, deprived of playing as children, but we had certain games we couldn't play. <laughs> and that was really a no-no. So, you know, like jacks and, and um, games that cause conflict, you know, as far as that. We, we could play games that, you know, as far as promoted harmony. So we were kind of very limited in the game aspect. <laughs> that particular night, I was talking to my mom, to mom, and I was just running my mouth, and I was just talking because I was really trying to get back into church because I had stopped going to church, and I was trying to get back in church, and I was wearing jeans because I had started, you know, from pretty much all my teenage years, you know, I. Just, my mother, you know, mama didn't believe in jeans, so, but anyway, when I started rebelling in my own way, I wanted to wear jeans, so, but I was sitting there in, in my jeans, and, um, because I felt like I had to get out of jeans before I can get back in church, and that was a problem, because I, you know, I, I enjoyed, I was very relaxed, you know, and, um, but she's, she was ready to go to sleep, and she said she could tell I was going to keep her up all night if she didn't stop stop it and pray so she said well we're just gonna pray but anyway she prayed for me and led me back just graciously you know into fellowship with the Lord and I you know when I talk about that when I really talk about that I can still it just all comes back fresh because that was really a, my real experience of, you know dedicating to the Lord for myself you know and she led me back and in filled with the Holy Ghost and everything that night. I think I just always wanted to do what I wanted to do. Between that early life and that 18, I was pretty mean. <laughs> just rebellious and, I don't know, I, I think I had more nerve and I had judgment because I just get in with the children, with my parents, with everybody most, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was just in corporate, you know, I just wouldn't corporate. If you said something was one, I'd say it was two. That's <laughs> what I, all I can say is contrary, you know. When Grandma would talk about her own youth, you couldn't help but notice a few obvious parallels to the stories her children would tell. But she had an interesting philosophy about this that I had never heard her share before. I could see, I could see it in dealing with my children and, and, and knowing more about what the words say now. Children born with different talents or, or abilities and when you accept the Lord then all that, that looked like was working for bad things, he gave you that same zeal or courage to do what's right. We would go out and stuff, you know, together. He and Janet would, would, would be with us as well, you know, be out. And many too sometimes, you know. And um, But he he, he would kind of use us, 
you know, like to make these women jealous too, you know, because he wouldn't tell them first that we were his sisters. This whole notion of applying the same zeal to living your life for Christ that you had applied to pursuing worldly things could describe many of Grandma's children. But there was really no better example of this than my Uncle David Bernard, Bernie for short. And he was such a good dancer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he was very, you know, just very charismatic. He was. That was in the world, you know, before. Yeah. But then when he when he when he got saved, and I remember when he got saved too, when he when he turned his life over to Christ. I mean, he labored down there at that mission. I mean, that was his heart. You know, he and he was after souls. He 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 wasn't shame. He had no no kind of fear with with the people on the streets, men on the streets. They respected him. They had a lot of respect for him down there. But. But one thing too, I love to see him do and, and worship, just like David, the uh, psalmist. When he were he worshipped God, he he was he just abandoned himself. You know, he would be, you know, he <laughs> church shirt tail hanging all out and everything. You know, what I mean, he, Uncle Bernie is a key figure in most of my memories of the rescue home. It's impossible to think about that place without thinking of him. He was the heart and the soul of that effort in many ways. Grandma came to greatly depend on him to keep the wheels turning at the mission. In the late 1980s, he would suffer a tragic personal setback that would have a ripple effect on the stability of that mission and on the Tucker family as a whole. We sat down in 2009 to reminisce about Uncle Bernie, who by that point had been in a state facility for many years. The family had never given up the hope that he would eventually come back into the fold and resume his role as that charismatic father, brother, son, and uncle that we had all loved. But in just a few short months, we would all receive a bit of news that none of us were expecting to hear. We know that God is restoring. Amen. God is restoring. Because he's, he's labored and, and God hasn't forgotten his labor. God hasn't forgotten. Mighty giant, keeper of the faith, we rely on your strength every day. And you carry the torch and the flame, extraordinary. You kept the faith, you ran the race with amazing grace.